Friends, if you would join me in a spirit of prayer as we begin our reflection on today's reading. Holy and living one, ancient of days and keeper of the precious now, it is you who have walked with us throughout this year, throughout the times of laughter and celebration, the times of gathering with loved ones, the times of silence, the times when questions overwhelmed. Throughout it all, it is your presence who has held us, who has spoken words of love to us, who has been arms of comfort, and it is you who meets us here this morning. May we hear your voice again today as a word of comfort, as a word of challenge, as a word of call and invitation and of love. It's in the precious and powerful name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to day five of Christmas. That's right, Christmas didn't end on December 26th. Christmas is a season that, at least according to the church calendar, lasts about two weeks, from December 25th to January 6th. Now, celebrating Christmas as a season that starts on the 25th rather than as a singular day has a lot of benefits to it. Well, it means that you have a great excuse for leaving Christmas decorations up a little bit longer. Personally, I like to put off taking the tree down for as long as humanly possible. And if you love Christmas carols, it means that you get to sing them a few more times for the next couple days, like we did this morning. And if you follow that old song about the 12 days of Christmas, well, then celebrating Christmas as a season means more gifts. So you can benefit from the after Christmas sales, and you don't have to worry about Amazon packages arriving late, because there are multiple days now to give and to receive gifts. Do you remember what the true love gave on the fifth day of Christmas? On the fifth day? What was that? Five golden rings. Five golden rings. There's a bank with an annual tradition of calculating the total cost of all the gifts from the 12 days of Christmas. The total cumulative cost this year would be about $170,000. Any guesses as to what the most expensive item on that list would be? The rings? Swans. The swans are swimming. Who knew? Unfortunately, that same bank doesn't do a cost analysis for our own local version. What did Tutu give on number five day of Christmas? Five big fat pigs. Perfect. And Bob Magoon, one of the authors of the local style version, said that he and his friends came up with that entire song in about 15 minutes while sitting on his lanai several weeks before Christmas. And I wonder if they, like most people, thought of the 12 days of Christmas as the two weeks before December 25th, kind of like the final countdown of shopping season. But it's important to remember that Christmas extends beyond the 25th, that the joy and power of Christmas morning actually moves us into the new year. Christmas as a season is a vital truth because Christmas is really all about transformation. The baby in the manger is more than just an adorable story. It's a story about how God completely transforms our notions of of power and promise and a Savior that comes not to conquer but to serve. Completely transforms our notions of hope and humility or humanity as the wonder of divinity is revealed in the simplicity of someone just like us. It's a story about the transformation, not just of one young woman or or one small family or even of a society, but of all of creation. For as the scripture points out, the heavens burst open with song as glory to God in the highest and peace on earth is proclaimed. Now the truth of Christmas' ability to transform reality, it extends beyond our sacred story It's part of our annual folklore. I mean, think of the transformations of uh, Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, transformed from greedy miser to a generous benefactor. Or George Bailey in in It's a Wonderful Life, transformed from the edge of despair and hopelessness on that bridge to a sense of purpose and joy and renewed vigor running through the streets. Or Walter Hobbs, Buddy the Elf's dad, who's transformed from a love of prophets to a love of his family in the film Elf. Or the Grinch, whose heart grew three sizes in one day 
as he transformed from self-absorption to the ability to love others. Yet unlike these Christmas miracle stories of transformation, true change usually doesn't take place in an instant. It's often not just one dream, one day, one song that reorients our life. Usually transformation takes time. It takes a season. God teaches us this through nature. I mean, water transforms rock and carves valleys through the mountains over the course of centuries. Species adapt and transform to their environment over the course of generations. And even the youngest among us here, the children of our preschool, are taught there how caterpillars take weeks to transform into butterflies or beautiful moths. Transformation takes time. And it often takes longer than we want. Ask any woman who's given birth. Or ask anyone who has been on a wait list for housing. Ask anyone who's fought through treatments for cancer or someone who's been marginalized for how they look or who they love and has had to fight for a measure of equality. I mean, I would love it if transformation was instantaneous. If the old me could be cast aside as fast as discarded wrapping paper on Christmas morning. I would gladly endure Ebenezer's lone night of ghoulish visions if it meant that the next day I would awake and would forever be the kind of humble and generous and patient man I want to be. But more often than not, transformation is a process. It's a season. And remembering that Christmas is more than a day Well, that tells me that the God who is with us on Christmas morning with its beauty and wonder and food and music is the same God who's with with us throughout the entire process with its cleanup and its taking down and readjusting and its leftovers. In that 2 Corinthians verse, it says that the old has gone and the new has come. And the way that it's written in the original Greek It implies that creation is continually being made new, that transformation is ever taking place around us and within us. The Bible talks about our transformation with a metaphor of of changing clothes, the daily ridding of ourselves of anger and deception, and instead choosing to don our finest kindness and cover ourselves with compassion. It talks about transformation taking place each time we choose gratitude over discontentment, saying that through this simple, brilliant act, we shine like stars. The scriptures talk about transforming the way we think, embracing curiosity, resisting the urge to simply conform, resigning ourselves with how things are, and daring to hope about how things could be. And I believe that God talks about transformation so much in the Scripture because God knows it's easy for us to get discouraged. It's easy for us to get down on ourselves or to feel stuck, to feel guilty, to feel like things are never going to change, to doubt our ability or our worth, or to doubt the ability and worth of others. And so God speaks directly to this, encouraging us with truth upon truth, reminding us that whatever change you might be in the midst of or whatever transformation you're longing for, you're not alone on this journey. Be merciful to yourself. Be kind to yourself. For you're not the only one aching for renewal. We all want the the hope and the peace, the joy and the love of Christmas to transform our lives and our world. The work of transformation is the work of God. And time and again throughout the scriptures, the work of transformation is is put squarely in God's hands. And yet how often do we want to take it back from him, believing that we have to do it ourselves, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. But God isn't calling us to get our act together and be our best selves. God calls us to receive grace, to have the courage to believe that you're loved beyond measure and that there is an inherent goodness to you that reflects the very image of the divine. It says that we're a renewed people, a new creation. 
There are multiple words to express newness in Greek. One means newness in time, like a, like a new baby or a new year or a new Madden game. The other word that means new in, talks about new as in nature, as in the first of its kind, as it never been done before or seen before. And this is the newness God speaks of when it talks about our transformation in Christ. You see, standing upon God's love for you makes you stronger than your doubts, makes you more full of care than fearful, and means that your wounds cannot overcome your love. Truths like this need time to sink in. They need time to take root. It takes more than a day. It takes more than a sermon. And when the scriptures, like that passage in 1 Peter, talk about our transformation, it talks about the transformation of our identities, not just our behaviors, but about who we are at the very core of our being. That we are more than our achievements and our failures, more than our degrees or our bank accounts. That we're a people of light, a people who once walked in darkness but now bask in a marvelous glow. Every time I read that verse, I can't help but think of Christmas Eve standing here gathered with many of you during the candlelight moment at the end of the service and how that moment brought to such vivid life that fundamental truth. That because of Christ, we are light in this world. We're a people of courage and compassion and creativity. We are a people of Christ. A colleague of mine who used to be a youth pastor a number of years ago, she would end every session with her youth the same way. First, she would say a prayer with them, usually a prayer that was much shorter than my prayers, and then she would say a little benediction. She would say to them, remember who you are and whose you are. Remember who you are and whose you are. This isn't just a message for young people. This is something that we all need to hear and be reminded of. Because when life goes sideways, it's easy to forget. When illness strikes, when the news from the doctor isn't what we wanted to hear, when relationships begin to crumble, when questions mount, when work stalls, we forget that we are a people transformed by the miracle of Christmas morning. I try not to get hung up on the liturgical details about when we can say Merry Christmas or when it's supposed to be Happy New Year or what we're supposed to sing and when. I mean, if folks want to sing Joy to the World in July, I say I'm all for it. More power to you. But what I do get hung up on, what I do want you to know, is that in the deepest recesses of your heart, I want you to know that God has drawn near to you that you are God's beloved and that the great transformative work that God has begun in you, he will be faithful to complete it. Amen.